Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Okay, let's start with a word of prayer. Sorry we're running late this morning. Father, thank you for the blessings that you give us. Thank you for loving us, calling us to be your children. Our desire is to always be obedient to you, to always be ready to serve you in, in whatever way you want us to serve, that we would recognize who you are and what you are, and, and that as the creator, sustainer of the universe, you have called us to be your children and to be your slaves. Thank you for that. Thank you for loving us. We pray that you would be honored by what we study this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, who or what is God? Part five, characteristics of God. We're finishing up the invisible section, and we're moving into the applications of that. How can we apply the personhood of God. One, his personhood reminds us that we can get to know God more and more as with any person. Perhaps one of the things that makes this statement difficult is we think of person as being a human. And God, obviously, other, apart from Jesus, is not human. He's, he's God. He's, he's a completely different kind of, of being. And so we have to separate in our mind personhood from human, humanity. Um, who can give me a definition of what person is? Something we use all the time, but can we define it? A person has personality. It's almost like using the word in the definition. Entity, okay. Okay. Characteristics that uh, make us individuals. Okay. Others. I, I like the I like the the word that has individual characteristics, uh, individual person. Um, a person is a being that is different from others that has. The ability to have relationships that has the ability to be related to and can function. If, if you're a Star Trek fan, you would understand the word a sentient being, something that can think and do and act independently. So personhood doesn't denote being a human. It denotes being some kind of character with characteristics that are individual. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 117 that the God of our Lord Jesus, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. That's what we're talking about here, the knowledge of him. Who is God? What is God? And so we've been going through that over the last few weeks. God is a person, an individual with characteristics that, that, he, that can be related to, that we can know more and more every day, that we can be related to. His personhood reminds us that we must develop sensitivity to his person. Under applications.
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. These are applications that belong to the section on on God is a person. His personhood reminds us that we must develop a sensitivity to his person. Ephesians 4, 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We have to actually be able to know how to not do things that cause God pain. Sin is a violation of God's character of God's nature, of what God has said is right. We have to develop a sensitivity to that. As you, grow in, as, as you grow as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, you become more and more aware of your actions causing frustration for God. As children, you learned what your mom and dad would tolerate and what they wouldn't. That's what we're talking about here. As children of God, we need to know what God will tolerate and what he won't. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the spirit. When a person's in a relationship, often one can tell whether the, their partner or friend is mad or, or frustrated or whatever without even a word. Linda's very intuitive that way. She knows what I'm thinking before I have a clue. I do not have that same reciprocal agreement with her. I can't tell necessarily what she's thinking. She is thinking way more than me. I'm not saying she's not thinking. I'm just saying I can't figure it out. But after being married now 40, almost two years, I guess, I think that's what it is. Don't, don't tell her I wasn't sure. I'll be in trouble. Um, I have a sense, though, of when something's wrong. We can tell what's going on. We've become sensitive to each other's emotions. As you develop in your Christian walk, you need to become more and more sensitive to what, where God is and what is a violation or what is not a violation. What delights him? You know, what, what do you do that God delights in? Probably ought to do that more. There is an, ob, uh, an objective side to developing a sensitivity to God. It's developed by studying His Word. How do you know who God is? By studying who and what God is. By studying His Word. By going out and learning what He said. How He... Re Revealed himself. Scripture is all about God revealing himself to us. I say frequently that when we study God's word, it's not so that we just have a head knowledge of God's word, but so that we know God, that we know him better. At times, we may even sense God's feeling, as Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 6, 11, therefore I am full of wrath of the Lord. I am weary of holding it in. Pour it out upon the children of the street and upon the gatherings of young men also. Both husband and wife shall be taken, the elderly and the very aged. Jeremiah could feel God's anger at Israel. There are times when perhaps we feel that as well. Maybe what's been going on in our country is a demonstration, a little bit of God's anger at the U.S. When Hurricane Katrina came and and flushed New Orleans, I thought maybe it was just because New Orleans had become such a pit of uh, sinfulness. We may feel His love, we may feel His joy, or His peace. Paul said he longed for the Philippians with every affection of Christ. Philippians 1.8 For God is my witness how I yearn for, all, for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. 
He felt that way because Jesus was affecting his heart. He wanted to be with the Philippians because he loved them. I want to be with you guys on Sunday morning because I love you. And I hope you like me. <laughs> I don't want to presume. <laughs> but you see, there's a, there's a fondness, there's a relationship that develops because of the Lord. We probably would not at all be related together if it wasn't for the Lord. And that's what Paul is saying. God's personhood reminds us that God is not a tool or an object to be used. When I was studying this, uh, wow, well, this would be a perfect example to have a genie, a genie lantern. You know, God is not the genie that you rub and genie pops out and, and gives you three wishes. That is not what God is. But for many, that's what they think. What does it mean that God is not a tool? A tool is used for a specific purpose. We use a toothbrush to clean our teeth, but we don't have a relationship with our toothbrush. Well, Ann might. But as a dental hygienist, maybe. <laughs> I, I do admit I have a relationship with some of my tools. So this, this point breaks down just a little bit. Because some things I like to use, and I, I like how they fit, and I like how they feel. But I really don't have a relationship with them. They're, they're, not, they're not relating, emoting back to me. Yeah, except when they hit my fingers. Yeah. Yeah, I've never had a hammer frustrated that it hit my thumb. Sometimes people treat each other like they're just tools. We network or talk to people only to open potential doors. Years ago, McGregor Baptist Church was the place to go in Lee County if you were an up-and-comer and you needed to know the politicians. You would go there because that's where, that's where all of those things happened. They weren't treating it like church. They were treating it as a place to get... To get ahead, they didn't care about church. They just wanted to meet the people that needed to, they needed to meet. Yeah, exactly right. Sometimes people are willing to step over others or mistreat them to get what they want out of life. That's not sometimes. That's almost all the time. That's just that's human sinful nature, right? They treat someone like a tool. Sad Christians treat God like a tool. If I do what God wants me to do, God will give me stuff. That is the wrong reason to be obedient. He's just a genie in a lamp. When they want something, they pray. When they go through a trial, they come to him. But when things are okay, they ignore him. I always found it fascinating when, when Chuck owned the store that when the economy was good, Christian book sales were down. When the economy was poor, Christian book sales were up. Why? Because you only go to God when you need stuff. Uh, when, when I lead in our, in our corporate prayer time, I always talk about let's do praises first. Let's not make God just the genie that we rub. You're treating God like a tool when you... Only go to him when you want. I try in, in my morning prayer to, to not ask for anything. I try to just worship. And just, just I, 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 this year I've been, I've been praying through the attributes of God in the morning. And letting that give me confidence for the day that he's in control and that he's in charge and that that he can do everything that he said he's going to do. I try not to treat him like a tool. God's a person and he wants to have a relationship with us. He sent his son to die for this purpose so that we can have eternal life. John 17, 3. And this is eternal life that, you, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom 
you have sent. Notice what, what uh, is being said here. And this is eternal life that they know you, Jesus. The one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The, that they know you? You're saying you there is a reference to the Trinity? Yeah, yeah, that, that would, I wouldn't have a theological issue with that. I, I would, rather than say it's the Trinity, I would say it is God, which the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all God. Yeah. Right, that's the, that's the way I would do it. Because the Trinity is not necessarily in view there. The Trinity is God, what's in view is God. I know that's splitting hairs, but... Right, right. Yeah, and, and that's part of what's being said here. God's a person and we, he wants us to have a relationship with us. He sent us um, Jesus, his son, to die for us. That provides us the relationship, but it also provides us with the ability to, to see God in some manner. I, I've said this repeatedly. I don't know what spirit is. So I have a hard time having an emotional relationship with something I can't really define. I know what Jesus is in his, in his humanity. I can see him in my mind's eye. And so naturally, our relationship with God is through Jesus. It is by Jesus. It is because of Jesus. And in, a, in, a, in many ways, it's through Jesus. Now, all that makes sense? Good. So we move on now to a new section. God is independent. What's the word independent mean? Don't need anybody. Oh, self-sufficient. Okay. But not needing anybody doesn't mean don't want anybody. Okay. It essentially means that God doesn't need anything or anyone. He is completely by himself sufficient, self-sufficient. You self-sufficient. Nope, not even in the least. Because you need air. You need some kind of nourishment. You need lots of, of input. God needs none of that. Just for an exercise, try to think of what it was like for God before creation. When it was only the triune Godhead. There was nothing else. Not even the blackness of nothing. There was nothing but God. Oh, by the way, there was no time. So it's not like it was a long time. There was no time. So you can't even comprehend of that. We have never been totally independent. Because before you were born, you required nourishment through the umbilical cord from your mom. After you were born, you required milk. You required somebody to change your diaper. You required a lot of stuff. God is totally independent. This understanding can enhance our worship of God because, well, God has a voluntary relationship to everything. He has a necessary relationship to nothing. In other words, God relates to his creation because he chooses to. Not because he needs to, because he chooses to. For example, if you show up for worship at your church, 
that's good, and God is glad to see you there. But he will not be worse off if you stay at home. But you will be. This understanding can enhance our worship of God because while God has a voluntary relationship to everything, he has a necessary relationship to nothing. We, on the other hand, have a totally dependent relationship. We're dependent on our parents. As we get older, we're dependent on our friends, family, job, education, etc., there's a sense that we need these things to make life, to make it in life or in make it in society. But we serve a God who needs nothing because he's independent. Look at Acts chapter 17, verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. The Apostle Paul talking there says that he's not really served by human hands as if he needed us to do something. God doesn't need you to do anything. God wants you to do a lot of stuff. God wants you to do things. So let me ask the question. If God doesn't need anything, why does he want you to do stuff? Love? Okay. Is there a sense that God wanting to, you to do stuff is for you? Why do Brian and Kate teach little Harper how to do things? So she can do things. Yeah, I've tried that, and uh, it's usually more work. <laughs> People serve God all the time, but... Who benefits from that? Sometimes God's plan benefits from it. Most often we benefit from it because we learn and we develop and we can relate better to God because we do things. Paul simply, God doesn't need us to do anything, but he wants us to do something. Paul secondly says he means that God is not served by hands because he is the giver. He says because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. But what does that really mean? We may get a good picture of this when small children buy their father a gift. Did they buy the gift? Nope. Not usually. But in another sense... The dad bought the gift because it was dad's money, right? See, the dad is the one who makes the money in the household. Similarly, Paul says that we can't really serve him because he's given us all things. So what we're doing when God tells us to do something is giving back to him what he gave to us. When little Harper goes out and buys mommy and daddy a gift, she didn't go out and earn the money on her own. It's their money. Or it's Amma and Pop-Pop's money. That she then gifted. That's what we do when we do stuff for God. We're giving back to him what he gave to us. There's a wonderful thing about God. He doesn't need us. But he calls us to worship him. doesn't need anything from us. We're created for his enjoyment. 
Now, on the face of it, that sounds just a little bit radical. It sounds almost like an evil villain who creates a monster because they enjoy tormenting people. But that is not what we... I'm sorry? Frankenstein. That is not what, we, what we're talking about here. One might ask, why did he create us then if he is independent? Was it because he was lonely or bored? There's a popular Christian song series that talks about God needed us in heaven. God wanted us to do things. He needed us to be there for him. That's not at all good theology. There are many things in life that I don't need, but I sure do want. A good piece of apple pie, hot apple pie with ice cream, vanilla ice cream. Sorry, no cheese. No caramel sauce. I don't need that. I need that like I need a hole in the head, but I sure do want it, and I sure do enjoy it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind having one. Yeah, I'll never get over that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, one of the characteristics of a person is that they're relatable. So for no time, before there was time, who was God relatable to? Himself, in the triune Godhead. When, when we're going through the, uh, the uh, Truth Project, Del Tackett did a, did a masterful job of, of illustrating for us how our relationships are built on the relationship that existed eternally in the triune Godhead. And God is replicating that to an extent in the world as we relate to him like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit relate together in the triune Godhead. Now, every analogy breaks down, and that one does as well. Zephaniah 3.17 The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. The Old, prophet, Old Testament prophet Zephaniah recounting how God delights in us. We delight in our children and our grandchildren as they do stuff. Imagine how God delights in us. He finds joy in us. Our worship songs to God are, are written in a way that typically we can provide him delight. However, God also sings over us and delights over us. I wonder what it's like when, when we're worshiping collectively. And I mean really worshiping, not just singing. Singing is a part of worship. But when we're truly, our heart is relating to him in worship. I want to be in heaven to hear him delighting over us. Yeah. He delights in us. Especially when we're following him, when we're worshiping him, when we're, when we're being obedient to him. When we're walking in the unique giftings that he's given us. The Apostle Paul tells us that, that God gave to the church the people that the church needs to accomplish the goal he wants us to accomplish. And when we do that, he's excited about that. Yeah, that's exactly the opposite side of that. It's absolutely right. How sad he is when we don't do what he wants us to do. And I confess that that's probably the majority of the time for the majority of the churches in America. Because we're all, fo we're all focused on the wrong thing. And that's a frustration. 
Scripture would say our high, high calling is to bring God both joy and pleasure. Look at Colossians 1.16. For by him, this is one of my favorite passage verses, for by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all were created through him and for him. For him. I have to admit, when I when I read this passage and I think about just human history, the last six or seven thousand years, and I read about what's going on in the world, what has gone on in the world, he created the world with the potential for sin, knowing sin was coming, knowing that it would be there. I, I know he, did, he planned for that because he called me to be his child before he created the world. He called me to be saved before he created the world that included the potential for sin. And so, as he looks across the world, as he looks across time for the last seven, six, seven, ten thousand years, whatever the age of the earth is, there has to be both joy and But I think joy overcomes the sadness because he knows the end of the story. He wrote the end of the story. He knows what's going to happen. At the conclusion of, of our world, when new heaven and new earth is created, there will be no more potential for sin. We will all know the difference between good and evil, and we will be related to him for eternity, worshiping and fellowshipping together. And there will be perfection for the rest of eternity. And if we had not gone through Adam sinning and all the other stuff that's still going on, that perfection would only be half perfect. When I, when I finally understood that, that sin is a part of God's plan because it makes perfect perfect, if you don't know sin, if you don't know darkness, how does light make any sense? And so when, when we reach the eternal state, the new heaven and the new Jerusalem, the new earth, there will be perfection, and we will know completely what that is. Then we will be truly relating to him. And he'll be relating to us. I've used the illustration before. You all have heard it. Eric Little. In 1924, he was competing in the Olympics. And he decided this would be his last competition before he went into full-time missions. One person asked him, why not just stop running now and go into missions? He told the, the person, I believe God made me for this purpose but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. That's a, that's a remarkable statement. When I run, I feel his pleasure. I can tell you God did not make me like that. When I run, I feel no one's pleasure. <laughs> Especially mine. Maybe the people laughing at me running would uh, have pleasure, but... But Eric Little was made for that moment. We all, you know, we just not too long ago read through Esther. What did Mordecai tell Esther? It may be for this moment you were put in this position. God put her there to save her people. What did God put you here for? What is your thing that God feels pleasure when you do? And it may be your entire life. For each of us, God has given us certain gifts. Intelligence, athletics, working with your hands, serving or teaching. When we do the things that God created for created us to, we should feel his pleasure. We should sense that God is pleased with us. 
I just wonder if sometimes when we're going through our daily life, if God doesn't get a little smirk on his face, he says, yeah, that's the way to do it. Don't you want God to do that for you? Don't you want to have the thought in the back of your mind, God is happy with what I'm doing? God's happy with me and I'm doing what he wants me to do. Creation's dependence. The other side of God is independent is the fact that we are not and we are dependent on him. Listen to what, God, what Paul says in Acts 17.25. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. We need God for everything. There is nothing in this world that God didn't create. Think about that. There's nothing he didn't create. We have created absolutely nothing. And God created ex nihilo. Out of nothing. Colossians, we, we read Colossians 1.16. The second part of that is, is, I think, just as important. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. In talking about Christ, he says that all things are held together by him. This means that not only does he give us life and breath, but he holds the trees, the plants, the oceans, the stars, and all the cosmos together. This is not a passive thing. This is not passive by God. This is active all the time. Jesus, as the agent of creation, is also the power source behind making everything that is here, here. This, to me, is one of the most fantastic doctrinal points that you could ever come up with. Jesus is actively maintaining this world. It wasn't that seven, ten thousand years ago, whatever the time frame is, God created and then just set the, the, the universe in motion. It is all created in power and maintained in power. There's nothing that is independent of God. It's all dependent on God. Kate used to play a video game. SimCity and, and games like that where you create societies in the computer. There are now actually churches that are in virtual reality where you put on your virtual reality goggles and in your house or wherever you are, you walk into the door of the church and you sit down in a pew and a virtual reality pastor preaches. We've had some discussion about that in, in ministerium and higher levels about whether or not that's actually church. And that's an interesting question, but beyond where we need to discuss today. But it's all virtual reality. It's not real real. It's virtually real. If you turn off the computer and Kate's playing SimCity, what happens? The city goes away. I'm trying very hard not to use the Star Trek illustration that you all know I want to. Yeah. Kate, I saw some hand motions back there. What did that mean? Oh, the power going out. Everything collapsing like this. That's what it is when God, what our world is. You know, the movie The Matrix, if you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. You probably wouldn't enjoy it, but the, the principle is there that we're... We're not real. We're in, a, we're in a virtual reality world. And then if somebody turns the power supply off, the world goes away. It absolutely is true in a way. Not even in a way. It absolutely is true. But we're not in a computer simulation. We're in a real that is, that is powered by the power of God. The infinite power of God makes this world here. 
Now, I made this statement a while ago, and Chuck had a response to it, and, and so I'm going to try it again. If God, if Jesus stopped supplying power to the world, to the universe, to creation, it would go away, and so would its history. Because history is inside the box. If Jesus stopped powering the box, the box would go away, and history would be, because it's inside the box, would go away as well. It's an active component of God's mission to power the universe. That from the time he created, it will never end because we go into a, an eternal new heaven and new, new earth. God will forever empower the world. Yeah. Hmm. Good point, Steve. He can't turn the power off. And so we go into this esoteric question of what if he did? That's kind of the question can God make too big that he can't carry? I'd have to spend a little time. That's an interesting thought, though. Well, yeah, well, he, he questioned, would our salvation go away? And my response was, of course it would go away, because so would we. Now, none of this can happen, because as Steve pointed out, God promised an eternal heaven and earth, new heaven and new earth. But I, I, want, you to, I want you to feel the gravity of God actively maintaining the universe that we live in. I know I've said it before, but salvifically think of Jesus being on the ground, nailing, being, having his hands nailed to the cross while he provides the power for those nails to remain solid objects, the hammer and the people. God maintains the world that nailed him to the cross. Even while he's dead, he did it. Well, yeah, he could, and he does. Yeah, yeah. The the moon actually moves. It's a, it's a, we don't have much time, but it's a great illustration of why we can't be billions of years old, because the distance that the moon moves every year away from the Earth. If we were billions of years old, it it would be gone, but it's not. The salt content of the ocean, if we were billions of years old, would be worse than the Dead Sea. But it's not. All those things prove young earth. But I can't go down that path. Father, thank you. Thank you that you called us to be your children before you created the world. And you created a world knowing that sin was potential and that sin would actually take place and you, saved, you called us to be saved, you planned for Jesus to come. You did this all so that the new heaven and new earth for eternity will be a perfect place where we know the difference. Thank you that you maintain this world. That is such a big point, Father, that you are actively involved in keeping the world the world. You chose us. We're not just an accident. You chose us. You created us to relate to us. Thank you for that. Give us a great time in the service to follow that you might be honored and glorified. We love you and we want to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. 
Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.